We'll see how it goes. I think I've got some interesting things to uh, say to you and challenge you. Uh, I'm dead interested to hear what you'll say in response. Uh, let's give it a go and see what happens. So, safe words, soft words, and talk day. You might remember I spoke to you initially about the uh, CONSEC study in which we looked at the order of events that were occurring uh, on acute psychiatric wards, the different forms of conflict and containment. These were the most common conflict and containment events uh, that occurred on acute psychiatric wards. Verbal aggression, PRN, medication and de-escalation. They were a massive part of the whole and this proportionately represents their frequency and the grey arrows proportionately represent the transitions from one event to another. So you can see the big initiator here is verbal aggression uh, and that verbal aggression either leads in one case to de-escalation or in the other case to PRN medication. Sometimes the PRN medication, to a lesser degree, you can see this pathway here, leads to the verbal aggression. We might call that the Bill Fox pathway, in honour of his uh, example this morning. Uh, some PRN medication leads to more PRN medication when it's not worked, uh, but it very rarely goes PRN medication to de-escalation. You can see some de-escalation goes to PRN medication. I've referred to this, this particular triangle of events as the minimal triangle occurs on acute psychiatric wards. So what I'm trying to uh, show to you is how important de-escalation and the management of verbal aggression is in this uh, overall context. Because if you look at all the conflict and containment on the wards, then in representation in terms of size, the minimal triangle is that much. And all <coughs> other forms of conflict and containment, from aggression, absconding and all the rest, the physical aggression is all up there in that smaller box. All of the manual restraint <coughs> and the seclusion is up there in that smaller box. These arrows represent the typical flows of events. So quite not often, if you look at the, the black boxes, represent flows into the system, so nothing has happened before. Huge number of these minimal triangle events happen with nothing happened, happening before. And an even larger number go from that minimal triangle out into nothing. So there's a bit of verbal abuse, PRN, de-escalation, and nothing happens afterwards. There's a smaller flow from this minimal triangle into more serious conflict and containment. And some of that, you can see, flows out into nothing. There's sometimes the other conflict and containment comes first. And then as part of the kind of the calm down system or the de-escalation, it flows into the minimal triangle, into the PRN medication, the verbal abuse and the de-escalation, and then out into nothing. So it gives you a broad scale picture of the actual size, the representative uh, frequency of these different sorts of conflict and containment events and how important this is in the system. Because this is, you've got some stuff flowing up into the more serious containment and it's some of the ways that the more serious events are de-escalated downwards. Uh, <clears throat> another study I just quickly want to brief you on is our study of interaction, of uh, how nurses speak with and talk with people who are acutely psychotic, who are cognitively compromised uh, because of their psychotic symptoms. So there's equal application here to some degree to, to learning disability. What we wanted to do was to get at people's tacit uh, traditional expertise by experience, so not the ordinary everyday listening skills that everybody is taught in their basic nurse education, but the stuff they have found created is passed <coughs> down uh, creatively from nurse to nurse. So we went out and I uh, got people to identify their peers who were considered to be particularly expert at interacting with patients who were really, really ill, and then we interviewed the experts. We wanted to know how they dealt with particular situations and particular patients exhibiting uh, particular types of symptom groups from apathy, withdrawal, hallucination, through to agitated and overactive and upset, distressed and irritable and aggressive patients. And we called from those people a huge list of potential interaction skills this is the, the, the take-home lesson from this particular study. Even the experts, each of the experts just have one corner of the overall field of possibility 
of actual interaction skills and methods for dealing with patients in difficult circumstances. Nobody, nobody we interviewed out of all of those 30 experts had anywhere near a comprehensive view of all the knowledge and potential strategies that could be used with patients in these different situations and states of mind. This is where uh, the soft word, together with the literature we reviewed, where the soft word statement came from. Uh, and it's also where our de-escalation, our talk down model came from. We took those statements from the experts about de-escalation skills and attitudes. We took those statements from the experts about how to deal with particular flashpoint situations. And we also combined that with all of the material that we had uh, and knew from that literature review of over 1,181 research studies and we also specifically looked at all of the literature around violence management that we could lay our hands on, particularly textbooks which have been written by various trainers from time to time, and looked at what was in there about de-escalation and what constituted de-escalation. And it's from that we extracted the 40 or 50 soft words statements, uh, which were just not, not just the statements themselves, but we had a whole background of... Uh, uh, of cards, little rhymes and reminders and mnemonics that would help people uh, remember the different strategies they had available for dealing with different situations. You can see up there the saying no postcard, uh, which you can see is, <coughs> what's it, is it an acrostic or an acronym? I can never get this quite right. So if you read it down vertically, it says saying no. And it gives you a, a title of each of the different things you should consider when you're uh, saying no to a patient, sympathise with the patient, attend and listen to their feedback. It's always best to say yes in some way if you can. Identify with the patient, so identify with their situation and show that identification. If you make a promise to somebody, never forget it. Don't just promise them something and then forget to do it. Give good reasons why the person can't do whatever it is that they want to do. Admit that you're not always right and if possible give the person options. So you're summarising a vast amount of different strategies in just that card there. And that card's there as a reminder <laughs> as part of the process of getting people to, to know and uh, get these soft word statements and the different strategies that are in there into their actual practice. So the whole aim of soft words is to expand the skills and the tactical choices of staff in the known flashpoint situations, but it's also to generate the use amongst each other particularly in the staff hierarchy, because the staff hierarchy and the staff relationships tend to mirror what goes on between patients and, uh, staff and patients and patients and staff, and even patients and patients. Uh, and it's also to provide clear and powerful examples to the patients on how to treat with each other and people in the community, which is another version of what I've just said to you. Uh, one of the ways in which we can help patients not get into conflict situations with each other is to show them positive ways of dealing with each other as human beings and positive ways of dealing with conflict. We can show and demonstrate that in our relationships, in our hierarchical and even in our peer relationships on the ward, uh, then we're giving a powerful example for that other patients can copy. If we treat with individual patients using these particular methods, we're providing powerful examples that patients can then copy in their interactions with each other. Uh, and, and they do, they really do. <coughs> but what's the prospects of this for a long-term implementation? It's okay for me to tell you, do you tend safe wards interventions and you'll get this reduction in conflict and containment? How long can you keep doing soft words? There's only a limited number of advisory statements and short summary versions in that pack. And once you've shared those uh, with the staff several times, people are going to stop registering them. People are going to stop seeing them. Uh, people are going to stop responding to them. <clears throat> and keeping them, putting them up all at once kind of burns them all out all at once. You've kind of shot your bullet and you've got nowhere else to go once you've actually use them, people become blind to them. So I suppose you can take them away for a while and then reintroduce them, uh, or you could make some efforts to reformat them or redisplay them in a new way, um, or um, you could put them together with pictures in a different way, just refresh them in some, some form, 
Or a team could be challenged to write their own verses or compose their own soft words to commend to each other. And this is something I've been tempted to do for a while. I wonder if I sat you all down here in the room for an afternoon and got you to put down your pithy best words of advice on how to strategically treat with people in difficult situations, whether we might come up with yet another different set of 40 soft word statements that we could then use to influence practice. Uh, how can you enhance this? Uh, well, you could enhance it by the, the champion selecting which statement gets displayed uh, depending on events, or uh, the <coughs> champion selects the frequency of change to suit what they think is necessary to the ward, uh, or you could enhance these by starting critical discussion around the particular statements. So the people on the ward could talk with each other about how and when to use this particular strategy and when not to use it. Uh, you could use these in clinical supervision. So the, whoever gives the person on the ward actual clinical supervision could take the soft word statements and discuss with the person how frequently they use the different ones. They could be used during debriefing after different events that occurred on the ward. Uh, and everybody, we can all ask ourselves, can we do these different things more in our actual practice? Another thing to do is to take 40 statements out there uh, and take them to a peer and ask them to say, well, how frequently have you seen me use these and which of them do I never use? Uh, of course, the last thing that, that you can do, and the one that I want to discuss with you, you could incorporate these in violence management training and updates. Could you not? Or could you? Uh, because there's an awful lot in there, uh, and this is the first thing that I discovered in discussion with Bill, is that given the variety of needs of the people who you train during your basic courses, and given the time that you have available and the curriculum that you have to cover, you don't necessarily have the time to deal with things to this particular depth. Well, I'm going to come back to this theme in just a minute. I just want to reintroduce you to the talk-down intervention. This is, remember, we, we devised a de-escalation model, um, and, oh boy, this is uh, jumping about, maybe I'm pushing the buttons too frequently. Uh, we devised a de-escalation model, and the wards elected their top de-escalators to, uh, to portray this, po this poster to them and go through it with them giving examples. So again, this was a, about expanding the skill and strategy set of staff, and it was about building their emotional self-management skills, self-monitoring, self-awareness, and psychological understanding, uh, and improve their selection of strategies, and improve the team cohesion, get people <laughs> sharing their skills with each other, uh, and uh, increasing the level of mutual support. I'm not expecting you to read all that. You can download this and take a look at it <coughs> if you want. Um, the process there is about uh, kind of corralling or delimiting the situation, clarifying what the problem is and negotiating and resolving to a situation. But uh, all along the way there is about uh, conveying respect and empathy for the patient and how you do that, and also controlling yourself, particularly your own emotional reactions of anxiety and frustration. Uh, and my question is going to be to you, given that there's a vast range and a vast skill set and different ways of doing these different things, how do we actually comprehensively prepare our members of staff to do all of this in an expert fashion, in an advanced fashion? So, our way of boosting these was about displaying the poster and getting people to share and talk and discuss and share their own skills and situations with each other. So that poster can be <coughs> continuously displayed, uh, and the on-ward training that we set up can be done once or twice, uh, <coughs> and updated again whenever there's some kind of staff turnover. Uh, or alternatively, the poster can be used in post-incident debriefing, and this is what some people did on the wards where we introduced it. When there had been an incident as part of the post-incident debriefing, they'd look at the poster and they'd say, what did we do, what did we not do? Uh, some people also used it in onward role play situations so that they could increase and expand their own use of these skills. Uh, but incorporation of that intervention into local aggression prevention training seems desirable. If you wanted to put that into MABO training, how would you actually do it? What would you actually have to do? How much time would that actually take? 
how would you actually deliver those skills and how would people actually learn them? And this is the, the nitty gritty of some of the things that I want to ask and discuss with you this afternoon. How do you actually teach people technical skills and interaction strategies that are verbal and non-verbal? Because telling them what they are is the easy part. Anybody can stand here and tell people what they are, or uh, somebody can give them the soft word statements to read, or you can give them the talk down <coughs> poster and ask them to read the contents and think about it. That's the easy part. <coughs> but getting people to be able to remember a large number is more difficult. There's a huge range of different skills and strategies <coughs> that you want people to be able to pick from and use and adjust to the right circumstances with the right patient at the right time, which means that there's got to be a vast number of skills and approaches that people have to have at their disposal to use. And to have them at their disposal to use, they've got to remember what they are. So how are they going to remember all of this stuff? Well, our answer was the changing posters and the continual reminders, and it was also these little postcards with the verses and the acronyms, etc. But it's still difficult. Then you've got the ease of use issue. You want people to be able to smoothly deploy these. Pick, the, as I said, the right approach for the right situation with the right person. And pick it without any hesitation, without any stiltedness, without any awkwardness or feeling that this is for the first time or whatever, or any hint of mixed messages whatsoever. In other words, for perf with perfect clarity for the patient, cutting through the patient's emotional state, cutting through the patient's cognitive compromise and any symptoms that they might have. Um, how are you going to get people to that kind of advanced level uh, of skill use? Uh, well, role play is one method, uh, but one 15-minute session on one afternoon once a year is really not going to do it, is it? <laughs> Um, personal supervision and feedback would be another way, and guidance from people with greater skill on the spot in the work environment linked to observed practice would be another way of dealing with this. So some kind of debriefing with people, some kind of observed practice. If I'd seen Dave uh, handle a situation uh, and maybe he'd done it fairly well but not as well as I thought he might have done or there are some options that I felt he might have liked to have used that he doesn't, didn't use, I could then sit down with Dave afterwards and give him some personal feedback based on particularly on his small corner of that set of skills that I've been talking about, the ones that he knows, and see if I can nudge him along to perhaps incorporating something new or trying something different with the patient on the next time so that Dave grows in his skill set and the next time, instead of just having ten approaches, or his usual six approaches, on which he continually and stereotypically deploys in these situations, next time he has another six that he can think about and deploy and try and use and incorporate into his uh, regular practice. But this is a skills accumulation journey that takes us years. If I think about my own practice and my own skills development, I am still learning interaction skills now. Um, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but you know that I started my training in 1976. But I am still learning, and all of us are on that kind of lifetime journey of interpersonal skills development. Uh, delivering people's potential takes, uh, presumably, years, and different people progress at different speeds, learning different things at different times, depending on their abilities and their commitments. How are we going to meet the needs of different people with different individual uh, backgrounds and skill sets and different, uh, a different part of the whole, <coughs> at different stages of their life, and provide them with a training and an educational experience that lasts uh, not just beyond the year or the five-day course or the one-day update, but that sequentially takes them across their journey most effectively and speedily um, at the right time over a longer period of time? And I think that's actually quite a big challenge that makes you think slightly differently about the needs of prevention and management and violence and aggression training, or perhaps even about MABO training, I don't know. You might have some responses on that. So training adjustments based just on that thought at the moment is that you can't accommodate this in mixed groups. 
necessarily. By that I mean mixed ability groups. When you have a, a, a bunch of staff, you go into a new organization and you get a bunch of staff who you're expected to take through a course, that bunch of staff will be at all different places depend on that journey, dependent on their background. You might have some qualified staff who've been quite experienced for a long period of time, or have a good grounding in many things, and alongside that qualified nurse member of staff who's had a good grounding in many things over many years, you can have somebody who was working in Sainsbury's last week, <coughs> or selling tickets at the train station last week, and is now working as a healthcare assistant on your ward, who will have a different skill set uh, and maybe be starting from a different position. So what I'm thinking this implies is that we're going to ultimately have to think about a, a system of streaming, some kind of basic middling to advanced level or something like this where you get cohorts of people at a similar stage of their development together so that you can titrate your, tra your relevant training to those different people and their needs more easily. What we also need is a greater uh, emphasis on the individuals. Now, I was interested to hear from uh, uh, the contribution from Jersey this morning about they did particular training for particular related to particular patient conditions, and they did training related to particular individual patients that were presenting problems. The missing part for me was that they weren't talking about training that was titrated to individual members of staff that took into account where individual members of staff were and what skills and knowledge those individual members of staff had and what was appropriate for them at that time to develop their skills and their practice. And I think if we're going to get beyond our tradition, what's become very, very traditional five plus one day update style courses, we need to start thinking about personal development plans for members of staff, personal educational records for individual members of staff, and strategic training that will take those individual members of staff beyond where they are this year to where they need to be next year and the year after. And that means much more systematic linkage between the training sessions and clinical supervision in the workplace so that these two things talk to each other. So that the, the manager, the shift managers on the ward who've been observing uh, Bill's practice can actually come back to the trainers and say, this is what I've been working on with Bill over the past year. These are the things he's learned and incorporated really easily, but these are possibly the areas where he needs further development. And the trainers can say, well, we've prepared Bill in X, Y, and Z this year. What we'd like you to give feedback on and check up on is that he's deploying those X, Y, and Z skills via your clinical supervision in the course of the next year. And if we both kind of share that development record to the benefit of Bill, then clearly Bill is going to develop his skills to an advanced level much more quickly than if we just consign Bill to a mixed group where he gets the same style of training and that's just repeated or updated year after year. And then we still haven't fixed the, the, the problem of accurate and objective assessment and feedback of people. And this is something where I don't have uh, uh, an answer for you. How do you actually assess where Bill is up to in terms of these uh, verbal and non-verbal uh, de-escalation skills and techniques? We can't easily give him an exam, and even if we gave him an exam, it would only be his kind of what he would actually say about it rather than what he can actually do, uh, which again might be really different from what he can actually do in the live situation with patients. So I think all of this is really, really challenging, uh, and it might be possible almost to, ha to harness uh, peer feedback as well, and perhaps some linkage to post-incident debriefing. But in short, what I'm saying to you is I think we have to get more organized, much more scientific, and much more rigorous with respect to interaction skill development if we want to get further than we are today. We've come a long way. When I first started my training back in 1976, the method of managing the violent patient was to assemble as many staff as you could get from all over the hospital, surround the aggressive patient, and then at the, at the, uh, the pool, there was one person who was in charge, and when he went to grab hold of him, everybody else went to grab hold of him as well, and the person was brought to the floor and was then injected. 
Uh, some of the cases I saw, they sometimes got their uh, IV, an IV injection of diazepam, so they were uh, basically anesthetized uh, and then secluded. That was the practice then. Now we have a set of training, we have a set of physical intervention skills, we're much more organized about things. Uh, but our training in de-escalation is, I think, still fairly rudimentary. And we could go a lot further. And if we are to go a lot further, it might be that this 5 plus 1 straitjacket needs to go. And we need to think in new and creative ways about how, how we actually back individual human beings in their skills journey and their skills acquisition. Ah, no, that was just the nonverbal and verbal de-escalation skills. What about the, uh, what about the emotional self-management stuff? What about a person's ability to stand there in front of an Andy Johnson, who's quite a big chap, and can get quite nasty, I can tell you, after he's had a few drinks, <laughs> and standing in front of him and trying to de-escalate him when you're feeling, A, anxious, because you think he's big and he's going to hit me, and if he hits me, it's going to hurt. Uh, and secondly, you're thinking, what right has he got to shout at me like that? Uh, he shouldn't be saying all of those things. Uh, he's a nasty, horrible person, and I'm not going to talk to him at the next conference I see him at. So all of that's going on in the head of the de-escalator, and they've got to be able to control their own anxiety and frustration whilst deploying these different skills. So one method of control of that anxiety and uh, frustration is to psychologically understand uh, what's going on in that situation. Now that might mean psychologically understanding uh, whatever difficulties it is that Andy's going through at the moment that means that when he gets drunk he, he tends to get rather aggressive and rather nasty. It might be about understanding how he sees the world and that can be taught, can't it? You can get taught perspectives. If you go onto the Safe Wars website there's a document about understanding difficult patient behaviour and that's almost like the, the range of, um, of understandings you might develop in functional analysis, only they're kind of more psychiatrically oriented in this case. So you can, you can learn those things, or you can learn them from conversations with patients. And if I think about PhD, I've just supervised, where we went out and interviewed nurses about their understandings of self-harm, those are a very positive or well and good understanding of self-harm, often developed it through deep conversations with patients retrospectively about their behaviour. So they, they'd speak to patients and listen to it, and they would think about it. Uh, and of course, you can also learn it from co-workers and your peers. So that's about managed learning within the team on the ward. It's about what you learn from what other people tell you other people's interpretations of patients' behaviour. Now, if the, if the types of interpretations of people's behaviour which are being passed around the ward team are, uh, and he's a nasty person, and just steer clear of him, and then when he's aggressive, we'll deal with him properly, you can imagine what sort of response that would result to in the team. But if that, that, those psychological understandings are deployed, it might mean at the very early stage, when Andy's on his the first one or two drinks, we might start interacting with him differently so that we avoid the, uh, the later confrontations. Sorry, Andy. That's right. <laughs> don't, don't hold me to account for that. Especially as this is being on video now. <laughs> Sorry. My apologies. I'll have to buy you a drink the next time I see you in the boat. Not too many. <laughs> well, not too many. Uh, tips and tricks. There are tips and tricks to control in your own emotional responses uh, that you can remember and you can try and practice. Um, one of them is to make calming inner statements to yourself. Others can be about uh, feeling your feet on the ground and concentrating on the situation. So a range of those. Again, though, we've got those in the Safe Wards documentation. Those can be tried out and incorporated into your practice. But there are some very effective ways of controlling anxiety and frustration. We've got these in psychiatry. We deploy them to patients all the time. There is anxiety management training. Uh, and there is anger management training. Uh, and both of them have sophisticated therapeutic methods attached to them, some of which are summarized there, about how people can uh, deploy methods to control their own level of anxiety and control their own levels of anger and frustration. So if we are going to help our members of staff most effectively, and we know these work, by the way, these are, these are behavioral guys, these have really good evidence behind them that they actually work, 
We need to, if we want to give people who we're training the most effective ways of controlling their own anxiety and frustration, we have to think about deploying some of these methods to them. So we have to think about guided imagery, we have to think about exposure, uh, we have to think about process diaries, skill guidance, all of those things also that are involved in anger management training. So what does this mean for you, the teachers? Does this mean that you're a teacher, a trainer, or you're becoming your student's therapist? Uh, Again, formal knowledge around these issues, there's too much for mixed group. If you want to talk about the psychological understandings of difficult behaviour, I could do a day's training on that, no problem. Uh, based on the work that I've done previously on what I've called from the literature. And that's only one small corner of this whole field. If you want to go on to emotional self-management and then go on to the therapeutics, of, you can't deploy that kind of stuff in anything other than a very, very crude and rudimentary way in a mixed group. It again implies streaming, personal development plans, greater and more systematic linkage between training sessions and clinical supervision, and team management goals and activities. How much role play exposure is uh, reasonable to deploy in the context of a five day training course to assess what skills somebody has actually learned? How much is ethical, effective, or how much actually sensitizes people? Uh, in the days when CNR training was first introduced, in the 1980s, uh, or when I and a number of other managers brought it into the trust where I was then working, which was Tameside in Manchester, uh, which was pretty early on in the training, they used to do a role play at the end of the training. So the trainer would act the, in the role of the, uh, of the angry, aggressive and escalating patient, and each of the students had to show how they would actually deal with this. Well, I was sat in my office upstairs on the psychiatric unit, the wards were underneath where the uh, management offices were, uh, doing work on my computer related, I'm sure it was probably to the care programme approach at the time, uh, and we heard this tremendous shouting and rage and a really angry patient downstairs, so a few of us ran down the stairwell to, uh, to offer help to deal with the situation. And we were kind of just hanging back a little bit because we could hear somebody uh, doing the de-escalation and doing the talk and we thought they were doing rather well. But eventually things seemed to be going out of control so we ran around the corner only to discover this was where the trainer was doing their role play. And we were actually about to intervene in the training situation rather than in a, a, a real violent incident. So it had a real level of reality for us. We recognised us and our hearts were pumping. I can tell you this was a re this for us this was a real incident. Possibly more real than for the people who are engaged in the role play. Uh, but sometimes that can be counterproductive because by exposing people to a bit of fear and then not carrying them all the way through until they get used to it, what you've done is sensitise people. And the next time they hear a shout on the ward, they won't go quite so easily and investigate. They might actually hang back a bit more and avoid a little bit more. So you really need to think very carefully about can we do exposure or related work in the context of a five-day training course? And I don't know whether you still do that as part of MAVO, but it's certainly something, it's what the anxiety management literature would lead you to deploy, wouldn't it? It's exposure that overcomes anxiety successful exposure in which that anxiety has been overcome. Uh, this behaviour therapy works, we know it works, but who's going to give the therapy? Is it going to be you? Um, who provides the time for the different students to engage in that? Is the, uh, uh, is the uh, workforce, is the trust going to provide the, the time? Who sells engagement with it to the practitioners? How are you going to sell this to them so that they actually engage with this kind of anxiety, anger management training in the right way? Or are we condemned to just relying on what we have at the moment? What we have at the moment is ad hoc, intermittent, unmanaged exposure and practice in the, work, in the workplace. And that is clearly not necessarily the most effective way for people to, do, to develop this kind of mature... Um, and um, emotionally confident response to dealing with difficult and disturbed <coughs> behaviour. So should you be working in tandem with therapeutic intervention by therapists? So the more you start thinking about this, the more you start thinking we need actually 
uh, to develop our training in a much more advanced and sophisticated fashion. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about respect and empathy. Uh, this is what we don't want, isn't it? This is uh, what we don't want is managers who tell us nurses is all about empathy and compassion and if you can't get that through your thick head you've got no future in this hospital. So if we want our nurses to express respect and empathy to patients, then the whole management structure has to express respect and empathy to them. That's the only way it's ever going to happen because it gets mirrored and magnified down the hierarchy. So the path to empathy is through psychological understanding and respect provides the motivation and then identification with the patient is the final step in this journey. How do you get people to respect patients? Well, one of those ways is to demonstrate it. And then I'm asking from a training capacity, if you've got a room full of people, if I've got you lot here, how am I going to make you more respectful and empathic towards patients in the next five minutes that I've got left in this presentation? How would I do it anyway? Uh, well, one way is to show and demonstrate that respect and empathy to you, so it's something that you can actually copy. Uh, I could show it in the way that I describe patients' behavior and the way that I refer to patients. But the other way that I can do it is through these kind of powerful, persuasive, heroic, motivational stories, I think. Well, this would be my guess of the positive impact of respect and the fatal consequences of disrespect. Um, just my thoughts, and you might have better ideas about how you can convey and teach people respect and empathy. So what does this imply about our training? Uh, well, we can do a self-audit of ourselves. How do we demonstrate respect? We can solicit feedback from the people that we train and ask them to tell us how well we're doing at this kind of thing. Uh, we can observe practice of others on how they get people to express respect and we can take suggestions for improve, improvement of ourselves and we can cultivate high aspiration in our trainees through those stories and I would ask you to think what stories do you tell your trainees often these are the things that people remember in their training what stories do you tell them as part of the training that you give them um, and do, the, do different strategies have different uh, degrees of success within a team of people who are working on a ward? If I'm a ward manager, what's my best way of getting uh, my staff to be more respectful and empathetic to, pa uh, to patients? Is it for me to argue with them that this is a good thing to do and to give them good reasons for doing it? Is it about giving them feedback when we've seen them expressing respect and giving them positive feedback so that we shape their behaviour towards uh, a greater expression of respect and empathy? Uh, or is it about me making a genuine display towards patients on the ward that I expect my staff to, to copy and to emulate? And which of those three strategies is the best? Uh, do I need to do all three of them? Which did I make? Um, is a, a, an open question. Um, selection and reward and supervision of workplace leaders becomes also very important because if you want your whole team to express respect and empathy, you want to select leaders who are uh, paragons of respect and empathy. And that means that you actually you have to have a situation where you're paying for really good caliber people. And at the moment, I don't think the NHS is doing that for ward managers. But be that as it may, Leaders are going to require particular education, preparation and support to demonstrate respect in all things and need to learn from and aspire to be, aspire to be like the people they see as being greater than themselves. So you have to have some picture in your mind that you're trying to emulate, that you're, that, that you're trying to copy. Uh, I have some of these internalised representations of nurses that I worked with, particularly when I was a student nurse, who had a very, very powerful impact on the way that I've respected and uh, empathised and worked with patients afterwards. I've also internalised a lot of the things I've learned through training. And more latterly, some of the things that I've seen as great paragons of virtue have been uh, some of the people who we've, I've interviewed as part of my research studies, who I think have been really, really skilled and almost saintly, if you like, in their performance of psychiatric nursing. So we all need those internalized pictures, and one of the people who provide those internalized pictures are you. 
The Mabo Tracers. I, I see a room full of influential moral guardians here in the training that you give. You are monks at the temple of respect, compassion, and understanding, ladies and gentlemen. What you show in your training might be what your students and the people, trainees who come to your course will emulate. Well, that means that you need to give a great deal of attention to your own behavior and what you say and how you do things in the course of your training. Your self-preparation and your cultivation and what it is that you're trying to convey with the way that you do things, which means that, uh, that training people in violence management is a do, it's a way. You are, mem you are members of Mabo Do, I would say, the way of Mabo. Uh, and on that thought, I'm going to, I think I'm going to stop, I think I'm at the end. So, summary, yes. De-escalation skills are a lifetime journey towards attaining insight, growth, change, and mature, confident ability in the face of threat. Uh, five plus one generic courses, I think, will never be the best. There's something that we can do, but they'll not necessarily be the best that we can do for people. So significant change has got to lie in the direction of personalized plans and objectives, targeted training at different levels, and strategic linkage between training and management in the workplace. These are the ways forward, I think. Uh, and that's my view based on what the research tells me and my experience with safe wards tells me. In fact, logically deducing from what we've discovered as part of safe wards and the learning what de-escalation skills are. Now it's a chance for you to tell me how right or wrong I am. Thank you.